Hi again, um, Michael Goldberg, I'm the professor for our uh, Beyond Silicon Valley uh, MOOC. It's great to be with you again. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, good, good, uh, just good to see you. Um, the 9 a.m. Eastern start time hopefully works for more of you out there. And again, then again, like always, for those who aren't able to tune in live and you're watching this via the recording, we're happy to have you as well. Um, thanks for another great week in the discussion boards and your personal learning assignments. And for those of you who did your action learning assignments, awesome to hear about what's happening with entrepreneurship in your community. So we're, we're so happy that you could join us today. We have a great panel, so let's get right to it. As we always do, I'll ask my panelists just to give a brief introduction of themselves, and then we'll go right to you. Um, so get your questions ready, and uh, we'll go from there. So let me start in the studio. I've got uh, Mike Belsito, who you met during our one of our lectures this week. So Mike, can you introduce yourself, please? Sure, I'm Mike Belsito. Uh, I'm Director of Product Strategy at Veritex, uh, formerly co-founder of eFuneral. Great, and let's start, let's go over next to Jonathan Ortmans, who's coming to us from Washington, D.C., from Global Entrepreneurship Week. Jonathan, thanks for making the time. So Jonathan, could you, can you introduce yourself, please? Okay, let's come back to Jonathan. And Paul Cohn, if you can hear me, thanks for making the time from Columbus, Ohio. Can you introduce yourself, please? Paul, can you hear me? Paul? All right, well, we'll come back. Paul, can you hear me? Paul, can you hear me? Okay, E, can, can you hear me? E Zhang? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Okay, let's start with you. Of course, uh, Beijing, China comes in the best. Um, so can you, can you introduce yourself, please? Hey, hello, everyone. My name is E Zhang. I work for Cairo Capital, uh, Venture Capital Fund in Beijing. We invest in early stage deal on our focus on consumer internet, healthcare, and so very happy to be here today. Great, thanks, E. Jonathan, if you can hear me, if you can introduce yourself, please. Yep, uh, I'm Jonathan Ortman. Um, I'm based in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, my, I'm a, a two-time, I've had two startups and two exits. I'm an economist. Uh, I work for the Kauffman Foundation. And my focus is on the work we do in the 150 countries around the world where we are helping fuel the creation of healthier entrepreneurial ecosystems and startup communities. And so as a result, we, we get a lot of exposure to what's happening in some unusual parts of the world. Great, thanks, Jonathan. Paul? Fort Washington Capital Partners, uh, which is an investment management firm, manages about $45 billion in assets. A slug of that is from its parent company, Western and Southern Life Insurance Company. Uh, and, and within that $45 billion is a couple billion of private equity. I'm in the private equity area, and we invest primarily through fund-to-funds, uh, and we uh, invest internationally, and we also manage a program for the state of Ohio, which is uh, the Ohio Capital Fund, which has a, a double bottom line, which invests for profit, but also uh, to stimulate venture capital in Ohio. Great. Thanks, Paul. Well, great. We have a great panel. And I know, let's go right. Suzanne, we have the first question from the chat room. We do. We have a question from Anthony. Uh, do you think that licensing leading edge technologies sets an unaccessible standard for prospective entrepreneurs? Um, so the question from Anthony around sort of licensing technologies, maybe let me start with Jonathan with you and let's let's take a global, let's, let's broaden that question a little bit. Um, uh, when you see a lot of what we have here in Ohio is sort of licensing technologies. We had a thing on with some of our anchor institutions and taking technologies out of universities into the marketplace. Jonathan, maybe you can sort of comment in what you see overseas, particularly sort of in the developing world, um, in terms of uh, technology sort of coming out of universities and, and trying to sort of commercialize that. What are the differences between what you see overseas and maybe what you see in the U.S.?
to the marketplace, whether it be out of traditional research universities or out of, uh, uh, in the case of places like, you know, centralized economies like Russia, you know, their, their tradition of having hundreds of research institutes um, uh, is a really important one. Uh, one of the things that has happened in the United States is that because we have been the early adapter in terms of understanding the power of uh, new firm formation in terms of job creation in our economy, is that we have, uh, we've also inherited, I think, a few, uh, shall I say, burdens uh, that slow down that pipeline of innovations out into the marketplace. You know, I participated in an event at the White House not long ago where they had invited the primary research institutions for which all of the presidents, research universities and all the presidents showed up. And uh, one of the things, because they obviously all get funding from the government and they need to re be responsive to these things, but the panel was actually a group of eight or nine uh, entrepreneurs, all under the age of 30, all who'd graduated within the last three or four years, and all of which had successful scaling companies. And each one of them gave the message to the universities, which was this. We need, you need us more than we need you. And so I think you've seen a, a, a kind of tipping of the balance um, where I think the ability of the individual, because of the power of technology and open source access to so much information and data now, where uh, the individual entrepreneur uh, is really in the driving seat, or at least the innovator, and the uh, and, and they're also more adapted to the idea of informally putting together teams that used to be done by institutions in the past. And so I think it's more of a kind of bottom-up culture. We'll create the team we want and make it happen. So unless you're in a really sophisticated environment like MIT, where their tech transfer offices are really, really very elaborate and efficient and well connected, and they churn out you know lots and lots of patents. Uh, you're, you're, you know, you're likely to face challenges. And so I think this ends up becoming a competitive advantage of other parts of the world. Um, you know, you look at places like Cambridge where they would turn around and say, you know, the dons and the, you know, basically the academic community control the university. And so they can't really tell them what to do too much in terms of licensing and things like BIDOL, which is the U.S. Act that sort of sets the tone of needing to use technology transfer offices for moving those innovations out. So I'd say uh, uh, it, it's a very interesting dynamic. It's one where you see around the world um, uh, other both public sector and private sector institutions looking to capitalize on what is, a, uh, I think, a, a, a kind of bottleneck in the average American university uh, and, and uh, research institution. And uh, I think it's definitely an era where the entrepreneur has the opportunity to capitalize on the fact that uh, they're really in the driving seat in terms of taking those technologies and putting them in the marketplace. Great, thanks, Jonathan. Um, let me go to a question that came in um, via on the um, discussion boards this week, and I'll, I'll start with you, Mike. Um, and you know, this week we had the we had a, a lecture on seed acceleration in which you were sort of featured in. We had a question. I mean, we had a video on angel investor and venture capital, so we'll cover all those things today. So, Chan Orr from Hong Kong asked a question. He said, "Are these seed accelerators in Ohio effective?" I mean, when it compared to others like Y Combinator, I'm worried that the not-for-profit, um, and, and you went through it at, an accelerator down in Columbus that's set up as for not-for-profit, a number of the, of the accelerators up here in Ohio are not-for-profit, um, may lack the drive of a seed accelerator, which has a state to make a success. Can you reflect kind of on the structure of the seed accelerator that you went through and this sort of division between an Y Combinator, which is a for-profit, and um, 10X, which is a not-for-profit? Sure, so we went through the 10 Accelerator, which was based in Columbus, Ohio, and it was a nonprofit accelerator. But as entrepreneurs going through the accelerator, you didn't feel whether it was for-profit or non-profit. Sort of that conversation never happened when you're going through the accelerator. You're busy trying to build your business. And I would say from our perspective, the amount of involvement from other mentors that were involved in the program, uh, from investors that were uh, within the region that were participating, that would come into our offices, meet with the entrepreneurs, that was active. And now, granted, it was the first year that the 10 Accelerator ever existed. So this program, they were trying to launch it from the beginning 
uh, as a brand new program that they wanted to try out, they put a lot of effort into it. So I would say the the fact of whether it's for profit or nonprofit, from my experience, we didn't feel that it had less drive than say a for profit accelerator like. Uh, y Combinator or one of the Techstars classes in say New York or Boston. What I will say is there are top tier accelerators and then it's sort of everybody else. And you know, programs like Y Combinator because of the history, the connections, where they're at, they're going to offer something that's maybe different than what say the 10 accelerator offered us. We knew that going into it and you know, we uh, we could have applied to any accelerator, whether we got into any other accelerator, I don't know. Uh, but what we saw that the 10 accelerator offered, we thought could actually help us. And in fact, it did. We, we were able to access uh, relationships and, from mentors that we frankly wouldn't have been able to make contacts with otherwise. So for from our perspective, it was pretty beneficial whether the for-profit or nonprofit played a factor. I would say in our certain circumstance, it didn't really. Great. E, maybe I can ask you just to quickly comment on what you're seeing. Um, I mean, the the, the uh, accelerators are, are sort of a relatively new phenomenon around the world, but in China, just in the last couple of years I picked up, maybe you can uh, talk about what you're seeing from a venture capital perspective coming out of the accelerators and how are most of the accelerators set up in China? Well, in China, I would say a few years ago, most of the accelerators are supported by the government, right? Where they put in lots of money and try to support the local entrepreneurs start their own business. So um, so that's about three or, or five years ago. I and mean, recently, I do see a trend that more and more commercial run accelerator. For example, I myself just invested in an accelerator two months ago. And they are very actively in, in looking at early stage growth. They're very flexible in terms of investment strategy comparing to um, institutional fund like us, for example, they could make a decision in one day or two. You know, they put in like a half million U.S. dollars. Just after one meeting, we would never be able to do that uh, with with uh, with, uh, with Taiwan capital here. So um, I do see um, that um, more and more money has been raised and put into uh, accelerator here in China. And uh, and honestly, I do see they have very very uh, good return. I mean, I, there are a few deals um, I see they make five times return just within one year time frame. I think that's probably the reason that drives this money into early stage uh, accelerator here in China. But that's good news for them, and uh, and also good news for us because we get a very strong uh, a pipeline to look at the, the deals and then we can invest in. Great. Thanks, Dee. Uh, I think we have somebody who's going to ask a question in the chat room. We do. We have Mindy live. Go ahead, Mindy, with your question for the panel. Um, hi. Hello to all of you. I, I live in Cuevetero, Mexico. Can you hear me? We can. Thanks, Mindy. Okay, great. Um, I'm actually a, a Clevelander born and bred, so it's been really exciting for me to tune into this class. Um, I live in Cuevetero now, and I've been here about, for about a year. Um, so my question is this, um, I see in a lot of the seed funds and the, and the accelerators the word tech. And um, my question is, tech in the name or tech requirements to apply or perhaps um, receive funds. So my question is, what about those that companies that don't necessi necessarily see themselves as a tech company? Perhaps they have a physical product, food, et cetera, et cetera, especially for um, companies or entrepreneurs in, in developing areas. Is this, using the word tech, is this something that could perhaps discourage entrepreneurs from applying, or has that happened in the Cleveland area? Great question, Mindy. And maybe, Jonathan, I'll let you reflect on that. We had a, we had a really interesting discussion in the discussion forums, actually, Barry um, Prawira from Indonesia asked something exactly the same because we've talked a lot. A lot of our entrepreneurs like Mike have sort of technology based companies. I think the reality in other parts of the world and Jonathan, maybe you can reflect on this is that they're entrepreneurs doing many times of different things that don't necessarily have a technology base. Um, do you want to reflect on kind of what you see in terms of this mix, Jonathan, around the world in terms of entrepreneurship between kind of technology based and other kinds of entrepreneurship? and then accessing programs like seed accelerators or angel um, investment? Sure, sure. Um, I, I think that the, 
uh, a, a tie-in to this also to our last question, because I, I think what we're seeing around the world is um, less of a focus on the word accelerator and more on uh, the creation of, I don't really know the best word, but we just call them hubs. Uh, you might describe it as a, a shared workspace that tries to bring the latest thinking in the context of accelerators, uh, 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 sort of startup community events and activities, uh, having a fund, uh, providing mentorship. I mean, essentially everything under one roof. And I think this plays into what we're seeing in the context of uh, is you know, is the startup community and whether it be early stage funding or whether it be the accelerators, is it too dominated by technology? I, I think the answer to this is quite simple. Um, the, the tech entrepreneurs, because the barrier to entry uh, was so low, have really led the sort of revolutionary change in culture in the entrepreneurial community. Um, uh, and as a result, they really set the example. Obviously, the fact that it was so easy to walk into a Starbucks with a bunch of people and to, you know, work on creating an app with effectively no capital or nothing but your time uh, and your talent uh, has clearly meant that technology entrepreneurs, I think, have led the charge. Um, however, I think we're seeing a massive change in this. Um, so, for example, a couple of the really good accelerators in the Philippines that I visited, they don't do any... Uh, software-related uh, tech startups. They're all uh, related to uh, people that are actually manufacturing and making things. So we've seen this, what people refer to as the maker movement. Um, I often think of it as the producer movement, people actually making things. Um, now I think that that community has entered into uh, this uh, scene and has, in, in a major way, uh, and uh, erred on, by, uh, helped along by things like 3D printing and new technologies, which have made it easier for people with, uh, you know, less technology-focused products. Uh, but I think you've also seen the fact that they are capitalizing on a lot of the methodologies, things like being startup or, uh, you know, some of these new ideas about how, or not necessarily new, but shall I say the, the dominant thinking of how you can do this efficiently without having substantial access to early stage capital. Um, so I think the maker movement, the producer movement is really transforming this, especially outside the United States, which let's face it, over the last 15 to 20 years uh, has become a major competitor to the United States in manufacturing overall. And so as a result, I think you're seeing a lot of, uh, again, competitive advantage being held, you know, in, in very underdeveloped uh, countries where they've got a lot of experience in terms of manufacturing. Of course, that also applies to countries like China, uh, which obviously is a whole different uh, ball game uh, capitalizing on this. But I certainly see that um, this is not just about tech. Think of tech as being the pioneers that led the change in the way we think and do stuff, the change of forming teams, not being about institutions. Uh, and, and doing this in a way whereby we're first focused on getting the formula right before we then start thinking about raising money and, and scaling a, a, a company. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. A great question, Mindy. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne, we have another question? We do. We have a question from Sandeep. Sandeep, you're live with the panel. Yeah. Hi. Uh, good uh, afternoon uh, to all of you. Sandeep here from Mumbai. Great. Thanks, Sandeep, for joining. Yeah. Uh, I had a question uh, for uh, emerging uh, economy like uh, India. Uh, what, in your opinion, uh, would be most suitable? Would it be a seed accelerator or angel investors to the venture capitalist based on experience? Uh, can you th th can you repeat that question, Sandy? Sandy, I just want to make sure I sort of got it. Are you saying kind of what's most what would which of these um, kind of entities that we're talking about, seed accelerators, sort of promotion of angel networks or sort of public funding of venture capital would be most appropriate to help entrepreneurship in India. Is that is that the way to characterize your question? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. Um, Paul, let me bring you into the conversation. You've been so patient in Columbus. Kind of from where you sit with the Ohio Capital Fund, kind of towards the end, with a, which is a which is a government-funded program where you're deploying private capital, but yet you're seeing companies that are sort of coming through seed accelerators, 
being supported by angel investment and, and all of those things having state money. Do you have any perspective for Sandeep in, in, a, in a market like India, which you may or may not have familiarity in, just based on our Ohio experience of sort of, you know, where should the resources go or, or should they go in multiple places from a, if, from a government or donor perspective? Sure, Michael. Uh, it's a good question, Sandeep. And, uh, you know, I often talk about the success of the Ohio Capital Program in bringing venture capital to the state of Ohio. But the Ohio Capital Fund would not be successful if there weren't the building blocks put in place at earlier stages through the incubators, the accelerators, and the angel, angel groups. So I think it's critically important to have all the above. But you, but you need to start with those building blocks of incubators, accelerators, supporting angel groups, uh, et cetera, uh, to build that pipeline of opportunity for the venture capitalists. The, the venture capital is not going to be successful unless there's a very large pipeline of opportunities for them to uh, choose from. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, thanks, Sandeep, for the question. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, let me go to a question, um, and, and Mike, let me address it to you. Um, you know, one of the things in, in, in terms of being a, an entrepreneur, sort of the challenge, when you started eFuneral, when we met with you and sort of filmed our um, videos for um, the MOOC, you were sort of out slugging it ahead with, with eFuneral. We got a question from the chat room, actually, another from India, Sudipu uh, Bachichara had said about, from a point of view of the funding agencies, how vigorous would the drive for funding be a failed entrepreneur? You have a new job now. You're not at eFuneral. Um, maybe you can sort of reflect on this question from Sudipo about, you know, the importance of a community in backing entrepreneurs, whether they're successful or failure, because what you started with eFuneral, now you've moved on to something else. Sure. Yeah. It, actually, just very recently, we ended up selling uh, many of the assets for eFuneral to uh, a company within the funeral profession uh, who agreed to keep many of those assets going, um, which, was a, which was a good thing for us. But from an exit perspective, this wasn't the exit that you know, we've fired out a press release about or anything like that, right? We, we weren't successful in really being able to prove out a viable business model for eFuneral um, despite our best efforts. So we came to the point where we felt like that was the best option, um, going with this company where we could sell them uh, the assets. And so in many respects, I, I am that failed entrepreneur that that person refers to. What I will say is I'm, now, I'm connected with so many entrepreneurs that have had experiences starting and selling businesses who are successful, but also have had failures in their past. And what they've told me about Cleveland as a community uh, right here in Ohio is that in the past, it wasn't as welcoming to uh, entrepreneurs that maybe had a business venture that had failed. Now, I would say, at least from my own experience, it, it's quite different. Now, granted, I feel like we went about everything uh, with our investors, with customers, with employees the right way in that we kept everybody informed. Everybody, there are no surprises throughout the way. I mean, our investors knew where our company was at every single stage, even when the good times are good and the bad times are bad, right? So when the end actually happened, all of our investors, there wasn't one that wasn't really supportive of us personally, you know, me and my partner, Brian. And when it came time for us to figure out, okay, what is next for us? There were all sorts of opportunities that made themselves available to us. And the people behind those opportunities were really supportive of what we did. And they didn't look at eFuneral the last three years as a, as a failure, they looked at it as a amazing experience, um, which is something that I certainly believe. I, I think the experience we had with the funeral um, was amazing and I wouldn't take it back at all. But I've been pleasantly surprised by the way that the Cleveland communities reacted thus far. Great, thanks for sharing. It looks like we have a question from the chat room. Is that uh, Tuan on? Tuan, you're on with Michael. Go ahead and ask your question. Uh, hi, Michael, uh, can I ask you a question? Of course. Uh, and you're coming, are you in Vietnam? Yes, I am. I'm in Ho Chi Minh City. Very good. All right, my question is, uh, how can entrepreneurs in the developing country access to such capital and mentoring program? Since, you know, uh, in such countries, there's a very few 
uh, kind of program like that. So should local entrepreneur have to go out of the country in order to get access to such programs? Mm, great question. Great question. Um, Jonathan, let me start with you on that. I mean, you, you travel a lot. Um, what are you seeing in the developing world? This sort of question, like from people like Tuan on in terms of sort of staying local to try to access capital or coming to Silicon Valley or trying to sort of go outside their country in terms of growing their business? Well, I, I, I think it's, um, it, it, it's clearly become for, or in our view, I mean, I tend to look at the world, not as a collection of countries with national boundaries, but um, those boundaries are really porous to innovation. Now. So uh, I tend to see a flat world of a whole bunch of overlapping startup communities. And as a result, um, uh, in, in a way, what technology has done and the ability to be part of global networks has done and to have, whether that be from a mentoring perspective or all the things that mentors can give you access to in terms of um, connection. Um, I think you go where you think you're going to find the right kind of person and investor in capital. Um, this has meant that uh, we hold uh, our, our project, Global Entrepreneurship Week, is in 150 countries, and we hold this thing called the Global Entrepreneurship Congress every March, where they, you know a delegation from each of those countries, about 6,000 people, they come to one country, which hosts it this year is in Moscow, um, and those people coming there, we, we always end up with people like you know Dave McClure from 500 Startups. Uh, we end that with a lot of investors, we, you know, we don't go out and make a point of recruiting them to come. They come because I think investors are looking at the global market opportunity of uh, where they want to invest. They're not looking just locally at home. Um, and so I would say absolutely start global on day one. Of course, you're going to have, you know, a, a, a lot of competitive advantages in terms of when you do have uh, opportunities to find investors and mentors. Locally, you're going to have a competitive advantage that you can walk down the street and talk to them. Uh, but there's no question about it. I would say this is a global world now. And, and in fact, the dynamic I see, certainly from them wanting to participate in our projects around the world, is that actually it's a kind of, it's, it's a race. I mean, the, the investors are looking for the really good ideas. Um, and I conclude with just one sentence, which is, or one, one comment, which is just to say, remember now that um, I always like to say, you know, and this is partly coming from the Coffin Foundation, where, you know, when you have no customers and no constituents, you try to tell the bold truth uh, more often. But I think, you know, capital is not always the friend to an early stage entrepreneur. We should remember that. Uh, you know, we always advocate you want to be bootstrapping as long as you possibly can. And capital is really there if you've got a capital intensive concept or if you're at the point of getting ready to scale. So um, you have to really remember that um, if you've not got people willing to invest in you, sometimes it's their way of saying you're not ready for this. Um, and so I think it's really important um, to view this from the perspective of, have I got good advisors? Have I got a good network? Uh, am I getting good counsel here? Um, and when I do want money, am I getting it from the right people that are also going to bring all the other things in terms of networks and, frankly, um, access to unique knowledge that I'll need to scale this in an existing industry and turn this disruptive idea into an innovation. So I would say that uh, definitely view this as global. Um, and there are now lots of, you know, whether you're looking at AngelList or whether you're looking at a plethora of new platforms that are growing up around the world, uh, think global because there's going to be someone that's really interested, knows a lot about your market, who's interested in seeing what you're doing. And if they don't invest in you, Almost all the ones I know will leave you a little bit of advice along the way. Right. Thanks, Jonathan. Eli, if I, if I might, let me do a quick follow-up um, on that question to you. I mean, you're born in China, came to the U.S. to do your master's, did an MBA at Wharton, worked at Microsoft, and eventually decided to come back to China. And there's a number of people like you um, that have done this. And I think, you know, to Tuan An's question about staying in Vietnam versus sort of going overseas, there's this other sort of question of sort of talent and return talent. Any reflection on sort of, I mean, and your own personal decision to sort of come back to China and do the work there? And then when you look around at other startup companies in China, how many people are sort of making that decision? They've returned from other places, they've gotten experience outside, and then starting a business at home. Yeah, well, yeah, there, there's actually a lot of the overseas returnees here in China uh, start a business. 
here. And uh, they, they come from Silicon Valley, they come from Wall Street. You know, lots of people have a global uh, background and uh, experience. And then most of the reason, um, well, at least they told me, uh, the major reason for them to come by is try to capture the uh, opportunity here in China because we still have 7% GDP uh, growth year over year. That's, uh, that's a good opportunity uh, you know, for, for all, all kinds of industry here. But I want to comment on that question. I mean, even in China, uh, most of the VCs are based in Beijing, Shanghai, or Guangzhou, the tier one city. So um, there, I do see um, there are many, many startups located in tier two, tier three cities. Um, they are no, they don't have enough resources to get funded at first place. I, I, most of the entrepreneurs from that place, they actually you know, visit Beijing, visit Shanghai, and, and, and socialize with us and try to introduce their idea and introduce their business plan. So I think my suggestion for, for people um, who are located in, in different places is you have to really leverage your um, network as much as possible and then use those social networks such as Facebook or, or WhatsApp and, and try to connect with people and, and make interaction and, and, you know, Michael, taking our example, right? I mean, I, I wrote an email to you to reach you out when I visit Cleveland. Otherwise, I, we wouldn't know each other. So that's a, just a, a, you know, a, a, a good example. Just search everything you have, you know, your alumni network, network your, your, your friends, friends, and, and log into LinkedIn and, and find anybody you can talk with and, uh, and introduce yourself. And, and it never hurt. And sometimes, it, surprisingly, you get good results from that. That's great. Thanks, E. And uh, Gumlin Tuan An, my, my, my broken Vietnamese, um, thanks for staying right. up late and joining us. Um, right. and we have another question from the chat room, Suzanne? Actually, actually Michael, um, Paul had a follow-up comment he would like to make to the existing conversation. Sure, great, Paul. Uh, thanks, Michael. The only thing I want to add to one is I fully agree with Jonathan about the technology being global and capital being global, but early stage capital is still very much local. <laughs> to the extent that you can't bootstrap, and bootstrap is the way to go early on, if you desperately need capital to start whatever venture you're looking at, uh, yeah, I'd suggest looking at the uh, incubators and accelerators worldwide because we do see uh, they do accept uh, people internationally uh, and that's a great way to start your business to travel to one of the incubators and accelerators and spend 12 weeks bootstrapping your business getting exposure to capital sources uh, and uh, you know, potentially you can raise some capital that way if it's not available locally. great um, Paul, let me stay with you. There was a, an interesting discussion in the um, in the discussion forums. Um, Leonard um, Horgos from Budapest, Hungary. We were going back and forth and talking about him. In, in Hungary, there's um, several EU funds that look a little bit like the Ohio Capital Fund in terms of putting some government money alongside private money. And, and some questions about when you kind of combine government um, money alongside private money? Are there different expectations around return on investment, re different expectations on sort of timing for exit? Maybe you can talk about the, um, the Ohio Capital Fund in a little bit more detail. Obviously, you did it in the video lecture and sort of how you um, balance that um, dual scorecard of returns that you're looking for in terms of returns and then other measures that you're looking for in terms of success. Sure. In addition to the Ohio Capital Fund, Fort Washington manages a few similar fund to funds, but smaller around the state of Ohio, where all the capital is private capital. There is definitely a double bottom line, we like to say. So uh, there's an economic development objective and also a financial return objective. Uh, what we found is that our financial returns despite the fact that we've got geographic limitations are competitive with, nas with national benchmarks. Um, but of course the investors very much are investing because they want to see some economic development. Uh, what, what I think is important is you say public money and private money. The private money does keep things honest and it, it does make sure that your 
looking for the uh, the best companies, the highest returns possible, and and that's really important. Uh, if you want economic growth, you want to have a capitalistic kind of view on where the where the capital goes, and and also uh, hope uh, maybe a rant, but you know also hiring an outside manager like a Fort Washington that is a for-profit company that invests in venture capital funds for a living is critically important rather than just leaving it to a government entity that doesn't have any experience in that space. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, I see it looks like we have uh, our friend Yvette from Belize coming in for a question. Yvette, thanks for your awesome participation in the discussion forums and welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Yvette. You can ask your question. Uh, oh, I, I'm sorry. Um, I was wondering, good morning. I was just wondering if um, the seed accelerators, angel investors, and venture capitalists, could they be local corporations or local wealthy people? Um, because they can easily follow up their local, you know, as um, maybe they want or should want the economic development of their community. Thank you. Right. So, I, so I, let me just sort of restate what I think was a question, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask it to Mike. I mean, it, it sounds like, and I know it, it, some, of, some of the folks like Yvette in Belize in the discussion forums have been saying, like, we don't have a lot of sort of local angel investors. We don't have local seed accelerators. And, you know, for communities, I mean, you're pretty familiar both kind of from your company and um, you went through a seed accelerator, you've reached out, you've tapped into to angel networks from kind of an entrepreneur perspective what in, in Cleveland didn't have a lot of this stuff kind of historically what has been kind of important in, in setting up those structures from your perspective well yeah from my perspective when we went through the 10 accelerator that was the first accelerator well it wasn't the first accelerator in Ohio but at the time in Cleveland there were zero accelerators now there are three right so that was just three years ago um, for us those networks really didn't exist here. However, the people did, the mentors did. So I think in an area where there aren't seed accelerators that are abundant to apply to and take advantage of, you have to think about it a little bit differently. One of the ways that we thought about it before even eFuneral exists is just sort of my own personal, just how, we, how I went about um, networking, so to speak, is to really look at each individual person in my community as, hey, how is this somebody that I might be able to, uh, you know, get a mentor-mentee type relationship from? What can I give back to them? How can they benefit? But also, how can they mentor me? Can this person be a mentor to me? I, we went into the 10 Accelerator already with many great mentors because, again, those accelerators didn't exist for us. So we were trying to tap those networks in other ways. And I would say for people that don't have those accelerators near them, Think of those individuals, think of those corporations in your area, network with those individuals, think how can they be mentors to me? How can you uh, create a beneficial relationship that goes both ways? Uh, that would be one way that I would think about it. Great. Jonathan, um, just a quick follow-up on, on Yvette's question in terms of, I mean, one of the articles we actually put in the reading list this week is asked, is there a seed accelerator bubble? I mean, we kind of went from no seed accelerators, now it seems like every many countries in the world, maybe not Belize, are sort of starting seed accelerators. Any any comments from your perspective and sort of what you're seeing in this sort of rapid growth of seed accelerators for a country like Belize, if they were sort of thinking about wanting to start one, any perspectives on some things you've seen around the world? Uh, absolutely, yeah. And in fact, um, at our research and policy group at the Kauffman Foundation, it's uh, a, a, a big focus of our current investment, which is uh, part of the problem is we've seen an explosion of uh, entrance into, frankly, the, the broader community of entities that are trying to help entrepreneurs, so the entrepreneurial support organizations. But we've seen a flatlining in terms of the number of companies that actually scale or, uh, or, or survive. And so as a result, we're looking at the fact that, you know, part of what is going to happen is I think you'll see a reduction uh, occur because there's going to be a lot more emphasis on uh, evidence-based or you know, collecting data, figuring out what works, what doesn't work. Um, so I think you are going to see, uh, uh, you know, you are seeing a, a great number of things. But this is something where as an entrepreneur, again, whenever there's change, there's always, you know, there's been a traditional 
concept of business for centuries. Whenever there's change, there's always opportunity. Uh, and, and I come back to the fact that entrepreneurs are really the customers of all these organizations are trying to help and they want to make successful. I mean, you know, I, I, I helped a small company called Dropify and Garner, connected them to 500 startups. They went to San Francisco. They're now back and getting ready to scale in Ghana. And I talk about them because I'm proud that as a company that, you know, we help do that. And I think everyone's wanting to do that. So, um, so I certainly think that um, what you are seeing is, in fact, there was even a private meeting in Vancouver last year where all the major accelerators got together and investors and discussed the fact that, you know, they, they really got dated models, and this included, you know, Techstars and, you know, a variety of the other ones we've already talked about. Um, and so I think you'll see, you'll, you'll, you'll see a, a, a lot of attention being given to improving uh, the methodology and what's offered. Um, there is one, for example, you know, Washington, D.C. actually had the same situation as, as Cleveland in the sense that uh, literally 18 months ago, there was no entrepreneurial startup community in Washington at all. It was a government city. Outside in the suburbs, there were a bunch of big tech companies, but there was nothing here. Um, and then one accelerator came, one hub came called 1776. Uh, they've been remarkably successful. They've become the sort of epicenter of the startup scene. Um, and um, now we've got two more. So we've got the same happening in even big cities uh, in terms of this being what I call nascent, but relatively new uh, what's happening. So um, I think the advantage here is for countries like Belize is to figure out what works and what doesn't work and what are the very best pieces that we can take from those people that are being successful. And I would encourage you to look at uh, something like you can go into Google and type 1776. I mean, they've set up a federation of uh, eight uh, shared, basically eight startup centers around the world, uh, but they're based in Washington, D.C., and, you know, they're, they're doing a super job at figuring out how to make this a global network in terms of mentorship, investors, uh, and obviously, however, rooted in one particular community. So um, I think there's, there's, there's plenty of opportunity for entrepreneurs and those driving the, um, the accelerators to support them to really, frankly, leapfrog some of the things that have been occurring in the United States and in other sophisticated economies. Um, and, and put a new generation on the table of, of uh, support mechanisms to help uh, New York. Very quickly on the question of the investors, if I could quickly ask, yes, massive movement uh, occurring in the big corporate environment. Uh, I have as an investor in our projects for our Global Entrepreneurship Week uh, work around the world. Dell, for example, came to us and they said, yeah, you know, we don't want to do what happened. We don't want to have happen to us what happened to BlackBerry. We have to be integrated into the startup community. We have to be a supporter. We have to have a fund. We have to be an investor. We have to be listening. You know, and obviously companies are looking for other things. They want to have good investments. They're looking for talent, uh, tech talent often. And they're looking for great ideas that can they can infuse into, you know, their, their larger scale systems. But the, the reality is there's a lot of companies now with chief startup offices or entrepreneurs and residents. And yes, if you don't have a very vibrant investor community locally, you should be tapping into uh, that emerging trend. Uh, and the same is true with wealthy individuals. Uh, I think, you know, all of these people, it's, it's becoming very popular to be part of the startup community and inviting them to sort of local startup events and just getting them excited about it is the best step to get them interested in potentially becoming an investor. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. Looks like we have uh, Tony Bury in the in the chat room. Tony, go ahead. Welcome. Ask your question. Can you hear me, Tony? Yeah. Suzanne, do you know, do you have Tony's question or should we? Uh, yes, actually, I do have Tony's question. Uh, Tony is from Portugal and his question is as follows. How would you weight the importance of gaining access to mentoring versus gaining access to capital, particularly in the developing world? Well, let me, I'll start with Cleveland and then um, maybe I'll, I'll go over to E for some perspective in China. Sure. So f from my perspective, it started with mentoring. I, I would say the value that, that we have uh, gotten out of eFuneral and just, I, I would say my entrepreneurial experiences in general 
Um, it's the they happened because I had amazing mentors in my life. And if it was just that I had a bag of money in front of me, but was not able to draw on other people's experiences, I I don't think I would have even known what to do with that bag of money, right? So. I think it's really important to put people in your life that have been there before, that have gone through those same entrepreneurial experiences as you, um, and, and gone through the highs and the lows, right? As entrepreneurs, you're going to have the highs, but you're gonna have the lows, and having somebody that's been there before and has, has gone through it all uh, to be a sounding board for you and actually coach you through the process, that's instrumental. And now, once you get to the point where you have this business idea, you have the mentors in place, you feel like you have that strong network, uh, is access to capital important? Sure, but I would argue to the point that Paul made earlier, it doesn't mean that if that access to capital isn't there, it doesn't mean that you're prevented from starting your business anyway, right? Many people bootstrap from the beginning. Many people figure out a way to uh, launch their business without access to millions of dollars. And and to be clear, even with the funeral, really the, the first piece of capital that we got was a $20,000 grant. We were super grateful for it, but in the grand scheme of things, $20,000 alone wasn't what we really needed to start the business. Uh, but it was just enough for us to start to prove some things out, which then led to more capital. So also don't think that just because maybe a million dollars isn't available to you all at once that uh, you, the capital isn't available to you. Even even in small amounts, that could lead to a lot more. Great, thanks, Mike. E, how about a quick comment from you about um, the sort of mentoring versus capital and, and how it plays out in China? Yeah, I, I do think the mentoring is probably more important uh, at the beginning. Um, you know, many, many times when we are uh, talking with the entrepreneur, they always ask, in addition to money, what kind of a strategic value you can provide. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's the question that we've been asked many, many times, and, 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 and same thing happening to, to the Android investor. So entrepreneurs are becoming more smart, and uh, they're not just um, looking for capital, but instead they're looking for mentorship, they're looking for resource, they're looking for network. So all that kind of things they're looking at and, uh, and, and we're, we, we should be able to provide as an investor. So I would say, um, yes, I do agree, uh, mentorship or so-called uh, you know, networking or strategic value are, are, are more critical in my mind. Great, thanks, E. Looks like we have uh, Lisa um, for a question. Lisa, nice to meet you on the WebEx. Thanks for all your great posts in the discussion boards. Hi, are you hearing me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. We've talked a lot about what funders are looking for in terms of having a viable product, a good business model, that sort of thing, kind of what I think of as more technical, logistical aspects. And I would be curious to hear a little bit about what the funders are looking for in terms of the individuals and the team composition. Because you could have a, you know, a great idea and a good looking model and the funders might decide these are not the people that I would want to invest in. So I'm kind of curious to hear about that. Sure. Let me start with Paul on that. And, and, and even though, Paul, you're investing indirectly in individual entrepreneurs through your fund-to-fund -fund approach, maybe you can sort of reflect when you're meeting with venture capital funds and they're pitching the Ohio Capital Fund on an investment and they're talking about their philosophy. When you think about Lisa's question, um, what are the kind of things that you think about? Sure. Yeah. And I'm uh, happy to. And I've also been a direct venture capital investor as well, so mm -hmm. bring some of that. Uh, insight to the table, hopefully. Uh, you know, ideally, in an ideal world, you want to find an entrepreneur and a team that have been successful in the past and are, uh, you know, serial entrepreneurs and, you know, veterans. Uh, unfortunately, that's, uh, those are in rare supply and you don't, don't often find them. Um, but what you at least hope to find is somebody who's got a really good domain experience and some very good insights into the problem that they're trying to solve because it was their problem at some point. Uh, you want to find people that are all in, that are, you know, are, are not, don't have day jobs and are doing this uh, venture at night, so they're hedging their bet. You want to make sure that uh, that if it fails, you know, that they uh, you may not have an income for a little while. Uh, and uh, you just want to find people that have you know, an incredible amount of uh, energy to break through walls and uh, make make U-turns when they have to. 
Great. Thanks, Paul. And thanks for the great question, Lisa. Um, Suzanne, we have another question from the chat room? Um, actually, we have Yi who would like to add more to the existing conversation. Okay, great. Thanks, Yi. Uh, yeah, I just want to quickly add in one, one more comment on that. I think uh, for any early stage deal, um, we always focus on the, the priority number one, always the team, because that uh, will decide whether the company will succeed or not. And as long as you're, you're competing in the, in the right market and uh, you're, you have a right model, I think the team is, is the one who are going to finally act to that. So we always focus on the team as the number one reason. Great, thanks, Eve. Um, Jonathan, let me ask you a, a quick question. Um, there's been a lot of discussion um, in the discussion boards this week about sort of lack of venture capital funding and, and Paul talked a little bit about the Ohio Capital Fund. And some of your travels overseas, and, and, I, and I think you framed it well, I mean, capital is not the only thing that is important. Maybe it, it's less important than some other things, but as entrepreneurs come through seed accelerators, I mean, what I saw in some parts around the world, whether it's in a Vietnam or other places where angel investing and angel networks are not well developed, venture capital funds may not be well developed. Are you seeing any kind of interesting things that are happening with donors or governments to begin to provide that access to capital or organizing angel networks to help entrepreneurs make it to that next stage in the developing world? I mean, I think everybody's focused on ensuring that we uh, have more entrepreneurs, uh, but more importantly, that it's entrepreneurs that uh, develop and scale successful companies. Um, and so as a result, yes, I think you're seeing um, a lot of attention. In fact, you know, I would argue too much attention, but a lot of attention from all of the traditional players uh, as well as newcomers in figuring out uh, how do we ensure that we provide capital. Um, so um, if, if I can just, uh, uh, well, I, I think, so for example, you've got, you know, I mean, this is something that you've obviously got experience with in Ohio, but uh, the, the, the notion that you're getting a lot of public investment in this, I mean, five, six, seven years ago, that public investment was coming in in the form of the ability to invest fully uh, in the requirements for a new startup. Whereas I remember when I first went to Taiwan, uh, you know, to Chinese Taipei, and they said, oh, well, you know, uh, <clears throat> we have this massive fund. We think it's really important. And, you know, it, it took them a while before they changed it and said there has to be a 70 to 30 percent match, meaning 70 percent has to come from the private sector, and they would give 30 percent. So. I mean, I think you're seeing lots of, you know, constant changes going on, both in terms of public funds, in terms of the expansion of uh, individual business angel investor groups. Uh, you're seeing, uh, obviously, we're seeing lots of revolutions occurring, both in the banking industry, uh, which is the newest um, uh, entrant into this, as well, of course, in the world's you know, massive attention to figuring out how do we make crowdfunding work. Mm. Um, and I think that's probably the, the, the area that will have the biggest impact, uh, which is that you will see, of course, people enter for different reasons. They'll enter because they're passionate about it, not because, they, not because they're smart, accredited investors, uh, but that will give, allow them to dip their toe in the water and see how exciting this is to be part of birthing a new venture. And, um, and I think, you know, we've seen, of course, the, uh, uh, the starting in the United States, but then expanding country, countries like Italy. Uh, but across the world now, we've got 65 countries that we're tracking that are doing work in figuring out how to have smarter policies that allow for uh, the appropriate regulatory environment that allows for crowdfunding, um, you know, to be more accessible. So I think you'll see as part of the overall democratization of entrepreneurship, you'll see a lot more individuals enter, whether as accredited investors or whether as individual, um, uh, you know, small investors, uh, which will, which to me is a lot healthier way of, um, uh, of, of getting broad societal based support for these people that birth new ideas and, and create new ventures. The only last thing I'd say is uh, just coming back to that point about, uh, uh, you know, what those investors are looking for. Um, I think the team is important. Uh, I think having someone on the team 
that has unique knowledge of the industry. I mean, we all know that so many startups where you've got a lot of Mark Zuckerberg, someone with a disruptive idea and is really going to change, you know, disrupt the market. Um, but I, uh, I know as an investor, I always look to say, have they got an old timer on there that, that really understands the trap and the realities of how you take that disruptive idea and turn it into an innovation? And I don't think that having a mentor that's got that role is always enough. I like to see that on the team. So I just throw that out as one, uh, one addition to that comment earlier. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. Let's go. We have one last question from uh, Christos. Uh, Christos, welcome and, and go ahead with your question. Hi, Michael. Christos actually is at work in Athens, Greece at the moment, so he has no camera or mic available. Okay. Uh, but he would like to know, is the entrepreneurial ability more related to access to funds available or to the capability to provide innovation? In other words, if an idea is appealing enough, would it find its way even in regions where access to capital is limited? And if not, what can intermediary institutions do to provide aid on that field? Good question, Christos. Mike, do you want to take that? Sure. I think it depends, but I do believe that just because access to capital might not be readily available for you, that doesn't mean that uh, your idea can't succeed. Uh, I have seen quite a few entrepreneurs here in Cleveland, for instance, that have started businesses and got them up and running. They didn't necessarily have access to millions of dollars to get things going. So uh, it now, just because that's the case for some people, that doesn't mean that that's a uh, unilateral absolute for everybody. So it, it really depends. But I would say if there's not access, great access to capital, in your opinion, in your area, don't let that stop you. Don't let that uh, keep you from pushing forward for your concept. Right. Um, e, any, any uh, reflections on that question from your perspective in China? Uh, in China, I definitely focus on the innovation capabilities because we don't have a problem of access to capital. We, don't, we just have too much capital here. <laughs> so, in my mind, access to capital here is commodity. You, you, once you have a good startup, you have solid business, you have a strong inter barrier. There are all kinds of uh, you know financial advisor so called here in China that help you to get connected with all uh, these uh, institutions. So, um, definitely focus on your. Um, on your business and uh, focus on your innovation, and uh, you you will have uh, always have a, a way to find out the capital. Great, thanks. Well, we've hit that uh, almost at the hour point. I wanted to thank the panel. It was a really rich discussion. It's so wonderful to have perspectives from around the world. E in China, Paul uh, down in Columbus, which is a little bit south of Cleveland, Jonathan in Washington, although usually um, living out of a suitcase somewhere else, and Mike with me here in the studio today. Um, we have two more WebExes um, next week at on June the 3rd um, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So it'll be the next day for some of you. Um, we'll have sort of a wrap-up session. We're moving into week six of the of the class. And really what I want you guys to be doing um, that, are, that are taking the class is really be sort of reflecting on how all of these lessons um, are playing out in your own community. So what you're learning from the Cleveland case study and, and what we've talked about on the WebEx and the discussion forums, and as we sort of look forward and what we do with this information in our communities. So we've got a great panel next week, and then we'll be for our last WebEx on June the 11th at 12 noon Eastern. I'll actually be um, with all my new friends in Greece. Um, we'll do our final sort of wrap-up session um, from Greece on June 11th, and that's at noon Eastern time. So. Uh, again, thanks to our panelists for your time today, to all the students out there. Look forward to seeing you in the discussion forums um, this week, and we'll see you again on June the 3rd at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. So thank you very much. Have a great day.